live in public. <laughs> Woohoo! First day. First day. It's time to build in public. In public. Yeah, I like that description. <laughs> um, so, you know, for for people who may be watching this, you know, many years from now, <laughs> looking back to hear how it all started, um, we were running lunch break, and we, you know, we found that as part of lunch break, we're spending a lot of time reading Twitter, meeting founders, meeting investors, kind of, there's a lot of different kind of topics that were showing up. But one thing that seemed to be kind of a clear, a clear, uh, strong direction of the kinds of stuff that we like doing, the kinds of people who we like having on here are people who are building something one form or another, right? And so, and I think this, this other, this trend of just building in public, I think is something, Misty, that you were pointing out. What, what, do you have a recollection of where that first kind of popped up in your, in your mind? Um, I feel like we started talking about it with the garage door open. Was that a blog post or just mm -hmm. a general sentiment earlier yeah, I feel like last year at some point? Working with the garage door open, with, with the, the garage, garage door open. up. Andy yeah. Matushak, right, has a blog post about this. So this may be actually oh, yeah, here it is. the blog post I just shared. <laughs> Maybe oh, nice. <laughs> Collided yes. our shares again, yeah. <laughs> That's worth an upvote. <laughs> um, working with the garage door up. So this was one of the one of the first, I guess, building in public related things. You, you said this kind of got you thinking about the the phrase. Yeah. So this was this was when last January. Was that 2020? Oh, I don't know, actually. When he I think he's it. like uh, carefully avoided dating his. Uh, <laughs> Smart. It's meant to be, you know, timeless knowledge. Yeah. But I mean, all of this past 12 months, there just seems to have been more and more discussion online about this concept and people doing things like I don't know, Sahil's open board meetings and yep. even like internal team meetings being on public channels and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, like people having uh, public channels in their Slacks or just parts of their notion that are publicly accessible. I think it's just better for everything. Like it's better for recruiting. When, when you get your ideas out there, you get more like interlinking. Right. It's relevant people. What What are the major kind of so so some of the benefits you mentioned are recruiting. I think that can be recruiting talent to come work together on a project. It could be recruiting partners or customers to become curious about the project. So it's kind of a form of recruiting. I think it could recruit capital to invest in the product. So in a sense, like recruiting is you know, maybe a, a pretty broad term for a bunch of different things that building in public helps for, like recruiting the world to, you know, collaborate around an idea, let's say. Um, yeah. So there's, I would say those are maybe some of the primary benefits. Have you heard kind of a, you know, concerns or sort of potential drawbacks or, you know, do you think there's some good credible thinking there on what, on what would be the drawbacks? I feel like most people's hesitation is always like, oh, I don't want people to steal my ideas. Or like, yeah, concerns about things not being proprietary enough. Mm -hmm. And if somebody if somebody were to say, let's say we were to invite somebody uh, here, by the way, here's the Gumroad board meeting. I think it was April 2020 on YouTube. Um, oh, cool. Oh, wow. which, is, which is fun because oh yeah it's cool actually it's worth it's worth a look because um this this may be one of the ones you know this may be the one i went to <laughs> um so this is you know uh, sahil is working on this company called gumroad kind of a creator focused uh, monetization platform to help people sell their creation uh and he's got you know obviously a big big long story around that which has been kind of a decade in the works and it's 
really working now. So he has these, he shifted from being what was a traditional private company with venture capital and, you know, a, a you know, regular cadence of, you know, monthly or quarterly board meetings to um, sort of, you know, a lot of venture disengaged with the thing and it's become a little bit more of an indie styled project. And uh, so now he hosts what, what were previously private meetings. The board meetings are always in private. And I've seen those board meetings, he's made them public. And yeah. he sort of said, everybody who's involved in Gumroad as a creator is a form of a stakeholder that should be able to understand what the company's doing and what the decision-making process are and how the progress of the company's going. Because if you're building your career on top of that platform, you'd want to understand the underlying health of the platform and how things are going for the business. Yeah. Um, so this, um, that was one of the main things that he described as being why he, why he wanted to run these things in public. Um, and he's done, if you look at about 12 minutes in, you can see things like the, when he opened the financials, which is a form of, you know, working with the garage door open, he opened the financials in Jan 2018 and, mm -hmm. or maybe it's look, maybe March or so, shortly after Jan 2018. And he wrote The Post, which is this kind of famous how I failed to build a billion dollar company post, which kind of launched him into <laughs> some notoriety. That, of, that was know. when, 2018? The, the Post looks like it was probably around maybe December 2019. There's not, not too many ticks marked on this, but that's what it kind of looks like to me. Okay. Um, so sometime around then. Um, and now he runs the whole thing in public. That's so cool. But it's nice to see. Did you check out? Um... All right. I was coming for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I like, you... tabbed through this board meeting a little bit. Super interesting. Also, I so just really... like that he's kind of just like sitting in his kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's hosting his board meeting in the kitchen. That was right around the yeah. beginning of COVID too, right? Yeah. So he's, um, cool. I think he's been a great practitioner of this movement and let's say demonstrator of, of you know, some of the reasons and benefits you get to running it this way. Yeah. Um, I'd say one thing I've also, you know, noticed observing him over the course of like, you know, call it like a decade or so, I think when we first met, is I feel like he's, he's gone from like a little bit, you know, I'd say he would, when I first met him, he felt like he was on the, you know, he would err on the side of being more secretive or more like kind of, I don't know what you want to call it. cautious about what you want to put in public. Yeah. Whereas now he's kind of sure. extreme yeah. opposite of like, you know, I don't care. Try it. If it's useful to you, use it. Right. He's kind of like, feel like he's gone through kind of a personal journey that has moved from highly secretive to like maybe on the extreme side of secretive to the extreme side of public. Yeah. And he seems happier and more successful and, you know, it kind of focuses his time on what makes sense to him and doesn't necessarily, he's not involved in a lot of like the kind of startup shenanigans, if you want to call it, <laughs> that sometimes yeah. you know, pervade, pervade these places. <laughs> Do you think do you think people would say, well, oh, now that he's successful, he can afford to do this kind of thing? Like, I feel like people who are hesitant are more, are more often earlier in their journey, mm -hmm. which is possibly when they could also reap like a lot of benefit and yeah, momentum yeah. from being models of this, especially as this sort of movement is a newish thing. And besides Sahil, like I, I, I can't think of. Like the space is still open for people to be like the person, yeah. the role model for this kind of thing, especially at earlier stages. But I think that's when a lot of people are a little more hesitant. Like, what if someone just takes my idea, or what if? Yeah, like that. Yeah, co -opted yeah, I think. In some way. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think it's a very. I think it's a great point to focus on, um, because I think it probably is. You know when. You know, especially if you're not necessarily like connected to, you know, I would say like, you know, Sahil, you know, very connected to some of the like most modern thinking, you know, par partially generative and in the networks of people who are thinking about these types of 
things. And so I think he has like good instincts and intuition around it. And, you know, he's, I think he, you know, he, he could be a great example, but I think when people are not yet, you know, they haven't yet found success, I think it is a harder thing. And so, so how can we kind of collectively as a, you know, network of people making things on the internet, let's say, how do we collectively like support and promote the idea that building in public is going to be a better way to start, you know, better for everybody. And then also how the process of, of building in public can actually bootstrap a lot of the benefits with a lot of the things that you'd want to get out of, um, you know, out of the very earliest days. Like it, it really helps get a little bit of flywheel going and the, the risk to being copied or whatever might be the other concerns, you know, seem, I don't know. I realize, I think, you know, I think there's very few ideas that are really that good. So it's not like, it's not like great ideas don't matter. They do matter, but like, it's rare that it's rare that the, if you have a genuinely unique, great path of thinking, which, which you may or may not have, I think it's, you know, rare to have that but it's i think more likely that you would start with something that's not quite that and you would discover it through working on something over the course of like a multi-year period in fact and so the yeah. building in public then may help you navigate to the success version I, i'm just thinking out loud because i was talking about it do you know venmo mm-hmm. did you know do we ever talk about like what their very earliest versions were no so the very earliest venmo was like all on text message and it was like giving your friends a kind of credit withdrawal limit from you so i could say like misty we're friends i trust you so you know if you ever need a hundred dollars you can withdraw it from my account but venmo will just track it and let let us know that you should pay that back yeah that's what venmo was it was like this kind of like social credit you know mm-hmm. trust network and you know it kind of like has like echoes of that idea today but it's not really that product at all it's it's a much more traditional it almost feels like social paypal or something right mm-hmm. but if you if you sort of rewind the clock to venmo getting started i mean i think it's i think it was i want to say 2000 10 era would be my guess let me let me actually look it up when was venmo created 2009 okay um so some sometime in that era and i think it didn't really i don't recall it getting to be close to its current thing in the first year i think it took longer than a year before it really started to look like what it looks like today I don't recall all of the, I'm trying to look on the Wikipedia. I don't recall all the timelines. You can t- take that as an example. It's like, could you have gotten to the right version of Enmo faster if you had done that in, you know, if, if there were more spaces in the world where you could publicly debate and discuss and, you know, tear down the bad stuff and build up the good stuff and kind of, you know, more just space for experimentation and creativity. I, yeah. I think you I think you can and you would. I like so that. I so instead of being so scared of someone stealing your like idea zero, think about the likely inevitability that you will change your idea a lot before it reaches some sort of fit with what people actually need. Yeah. And the reality of the more people and the more voices you have in that process, the faster that'll be and that's just better for everyone involved. Yeah, it's kind of like letting go of this idea of this kind of like sticky attachment to the first kind of crystallized yeah, yeah. Of, of what you're building. Yeah, it's. I mean, people talk about these like these moments as if like everything happened at a moment, and really everything is really a process, right? And so yeah. I think the more that people recognize that, you know creating something new is a process. Like, it's not like the day you launch your newsletter that it all works. It's like, that's the first time you get anybody to, you know, subscribe. And then you sort of iterate on what works for you and what works for 
your audience and what's the interplay, but you kind of, you can go in with a strong vision. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do that, that everything's just iterative, but I do think that, I do think that there's like too much weight put on like the single, the singular like idea in a sense relative to like all of the, you know, I think historically all of that kind of learning and iteration and kind of the molding to create the sculpture is done oftentimes with the garage door closed with a small early team of five, mm -hmm. 10 people plus some networks of supporters, enthusiasts, advisors, investors, whatever. But I think what what's different now is you can actually open up the garage door and you can do that with the whole internet or kind of anybody who's anybody from the internet who's interested in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, yeah, it seems, I mean, I think, I think Y Combinator itself is a version of this where, you know, you've got your cohort, your batch that you're building stuff, you're building your company and product while going through a batch of other people building other companies and products. And there's probably enough trust that there's like a bunch of interplay of ideas, advice, networks that help there. So in a sense, it's like almost like a Petri dish of building in public and I think people get a lot of value out of the program because that Petri dish exists. Mm -hmm. And like, do companies sometimes see somebody else's working and try to pivot and do exactly that? Like, I mean, I guess maybe it sometimes happens. I, I don't know of any cases. Yeah. It just seems like it'd be, it seems like you just like would miss the depends on what you're building. Like, if it's yeah. like highly IP based, like some biotech innovation where there's like some medical breakthrough that just happened and then it makes sense but for the majority of things that people in tech seem to be building more like software based products that pull on like social dynamics i think you're saying it's it's kind of unlikely that you your idea is like that much of a breakthrough that no one else has or would have really thought of it it's not the idea on its own legs that changes the world but more like the process of how it comes to exist as a thing yeah. <laughs> which yeah. involves a lot of people i mean even even look at the i'm i'm back on the 12 minutes in chart on the sahil video you know you look at jan 2014 tick and the thing looks if if in fact that's like from 2012 through 2014 you know it's just maybe fits and starts of some volume over the course of two years so if you look at that and you say like, what did the first year look like? It basically looks like a zero. It looks like nothing at all happened during that first year. Even though I'm sure they were like iterating the product and you know, I'm sure they had some transactions flowing, but it you know, probably looked roughly like a zero. So if like, it wouldn't be like, if you were in Y Combinator with that, it wouldn't be like everybody in your cohort is like, oh, we've got to copy Gumroad. That looks great. <laughs> Cause yeah. you're just like, okay, some, Somebody's crazy enough to keep pushing on that. That doesn't look like anything to me, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's only, you know, it's only a couple years in where it really starts to look like something that, you know, and even then I think you could argue, oh, it's niche market. It, you know, it's up one month, but then it's way down the next month. And so it might've just been an anomaly. Like there's a, there's a lot to be skeptical of for many years to get to what now looks like a pretty successful platform. Mm. Yeah. I wonder what it'll mean for the dynamics between the traditional players in this ecosystem. Like you have founders and VCs and I don't know, maybe like operational advisors or mentors that people build up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of thinking about Nick Hill's writing on how, what, who is the best venture capitalist or VC firm or solo individual changes mm -hmm. over time. If founders yeah. are building more and more in public and it's not just like behind closed doors, I'm talking to this one like storied VC who invested in my right. thing. And it's all sort of like elite, very private networks at play. I wonder how that changes what people will find valuable in an investor or like maybe it becomes more about their network and their audience and, their kind of social footprint than it was before. Yeah. yeah, man, I think you're seeing that trend that you're talking about a lot with, you know, I think there's the story of, you know, A16Z building a media yeah, empire yeah. is, you know, certainly like one, you know, strong example of that, you know, very large scale kind of ambitious example of that. But I think there's also like small scale upstart 
you know, versions, which are, let's say, newsletter writer led, right? So, you know, somebody like, like Lenny Ratsitsky is primarily known as a newsletter writer, I'd say. And he also does angel investing. And mm -hmm. he could pull the other syndicates of angels. And like, I think he's involved in some ex Airbnb syndicates and stuff. So like, he's more of a media brand who also invests rather than being like an investor trying to build a media arm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then I think like Legion is an example where she came from a 16 Z left and built up kind of her media brand and story and then launched her venture capital firm to sort of, you know, kind of be the business model for her media brand. Mm -hmm. Again, not saying step one is build a venture capital firm, but step one is build a media brand, figure out how you're going to, you know, yeah. who, who you're speaking to and tell your story. And then you can sort of build the venture firm around that. Um, and then I think the more extreme example of that is, you know, I think it's, I think it was announced, was, was it that, was it Mr. Beast who recently announced a, a venture capital firm or fund around him? Oh yeah, that sounds right. Let me, I'm just going to do a quick search, make sure I have this right. Um, but Mr. Beast is a, you know, Mr. Beast Management Company, Night Media, has a new venture fund that's backed by creators. This was March 18th. Yeah, so a little under a month ago. And so this is an example of somebody who, like, you know, I don't know his whole story, but I think he started making YouTube videos, like, eight or ten years ago. And he was exclusively focused on being a media creator for many, many years. And at the scale he's operating, he's kind of like, well, I guess I could also get access and do, you know, venture capitally type things because of this audience media brand. Yeah. There's really interesting interplay between kind of, you know, the traditional venture, you know, venture firms and then the solo capitalist movement that oftentimes is strongly instigated by people who don't necessarily like, call themselves creators, but they're, you know, online writers, let's say, you know, minimum. Yeah. And then there's the, you know, the people who sort of start more as media creators and sort of back into venture capital. It feels like that's the sweet spot of where kind of everything interesting is happening these days. Yeah, it almost feels like the narrative is sort of becoming like get famous and then do whatever you want. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like grow a brand of around yourself for x thing right. and then you can like use that to basically expand into any number of other yeah. things that you want like who was talking about this earlier oh i was making when i was making the highlights from tina's session she was talking about how like virgil abloh i don't remember what his first career was but it wasn't fashion design it was like something else that he built some following around but like wasn't that amazing at it but then right. like he pivoted to fashion design and now he's like virgil abloh right so <laughs> as one example of sort of like get people excited around you about something and then like you have a lot of op optionality but then yeah. i guess the focus and question becomes how you should do that like what do you pick and how do you go about it and like yeah, yeah how that's... do you become a lenny or a legion yeah. or like a founder who well, i think yeah maybe maybe it's, think... it's different on the investor and founder side but yeah yeah I... Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't say I have like fully formed thoughts on the investor versus founder dynamic for that. But I think certainly like building a brand, having an audience or having like a community or network of people who trust you. And, and those are like, there's slight differences in how you talk about that. But but having people who trust you actually is the optionality to kind of, you know, do what comes next. And if you're starting from scratch and you don't have anybody who trusts you or knows you, it's hard to like, you know, it's hard to bridge the gap from like the reality we're at today to like the reality that could be if only thing X, Y, or Z were built or created. So I think, um, you know, it's, it is kind of like audience is ultimate, is the ultimate um, optionality in a sense, like, you know, people who trust you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like where to start? So I think, <clears throat> I think, I think that's a great question. I think that people, people prop, I see people who are trying to do things and they are maybe not, maybe not cognizant of the fact that you can't just be 
in the flow of the kinds of things that you see. You have to understand that like your position in the flow should inform how you approach it. And, and what I mean by that is if you're like, you know, if, you know, if you're, if you're Mark Andreessen, you can write the, it's time to build blog posts, which is a very general call to action. And a lot of people are excited about that and will read that. And, you know, that's because of a lot of the, the trust that he's built over the years. Um, if you're a brand new blogger, you can come up with the exact same words and it would, it just wouldn't land and you don't have the audience, you don't have the trust. And so I think in a sense, you know, earning the ability to write very general pieces comes from yeah. focus in narrow where you can build trust. And so it's not to say that you, you know, I don't think you should pick something that's not you that you don't actually care about just because you think it will work. <laughs> but I think you have to find the thing that like overlaps the thing you actually care about with the thing that is not yet told or not told in the way that you want to tell it. And it's kind of both easy and hard to find. Like it, it's easy because it's kind of staring you in the face, but it doesn't look like the pattern. And so you're kind of like, yeah, but that's, yeah. that's about that thing yeah. that nobody really cares about because nobody writes about that. So why am I going to write about that? And yeah. that's when kind of alarm bells need to go off. And you're like, oh, actually, it's, it's interesting to me. It's probably interesting to more people. Nobody writes about it. That's why it's an opportunity, you know? So kind of looking yeah. for things that might feel a little off pattern. And probably enough people don't just like go past that initial pinch of hesitation and actually try the thing. Because some things are, maybe are too niche or it just isn't working mm -hmm. out and then you go do something else. But I think like the speed of iteration or, or like actually production and getting things out to test matters a lot there. Right. But, but I think, yeah, I think it's, it's too attractive and comfortable to do the stuff that looks familiar. So you kind of have to get comfortable with discomfort, I'd say. And I think that's maybe the one lesson, you know, whether anybody creating something new for any reason, you have to kind of get comfortable with discomfort and you just be okay with it. Like, you hear people who are sort of, you know, they want to get into angel investing and you're like, okay, well, what kind of investments do you want to make? Like, you know, oh, like, you know, AI and robotics and machine learning. Like, okay, like you and everybody talks about those. So like, why should we be talking to you? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you said like, look, I've, you know, I've got this like record collection and I really care about like vintage vinyl. I'm like, I'm not really sure like how that applies to investing, but like I have a really famous blog about that kind of stuff. Like, I don't know. To me, that sounds like at least a starting point yeah. to start to navigate towards, okay, there's something interesting here. There's something unique. There's some special, fresh voice, something more distinctive yeah. within the venture. Like, I'm not saying that caring about vinyls is distinctive in the world. There's probably lots of people who do. But having that perspective in kind of the angel ecosystem is not very common. Like yeah. you, can build a, you can build a brand around that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's really cool. Because then you would actually be like, be the number one go-to person in some area and then that'll lead to offshoot things that make you a go-to person in areas that you would never have earned the right to sort of be playing in anyway. Yeah. Just like approaching them cold. Yeah. I think it's, it's actually kind of, it's kind of the Jason Jacobs story with my climate journey, which is he's like just intensely curious about climate stuff. And so he started this podcast and started interviewing people and meeting people. And, you know, I think the, you know, the framework of my climate journey is very climate focused, but as you get climate focused, you also notice like, there's like the software, which runs the HVAC systems that is, helps make, you know, real estate more efficient is actually, you know, kind of connected to climate in a little bit of a not necessarily obvious way. And so you start broadening your platform to these things that are like, climate adjacent or like you know clubhouse is considered climate and that you don't have to fly to conferences as much you know to be able to meet people and that has impact and so you know i think it actually is just like find a unique starting point and then like the broadening will naturally occur to you and to other people versus you know when people start very broad but they they don't have like 
a win at something or you know be known for something through some you know, it doesn't matter exactly exactly what but um and i think it's always it's always from your background right there's always something that you did that was like unique and brings <clears throat> brings unique perspective yeah like i i bet i bet that there's stuff that you know from your time in as an allocator that you know without revealing specifics of you know anything proprietary confidential but just it's like workflow processes skepticism optimism that you could actually write about and articulate like most people most people have never been in an allocator they don't know the decisions they don't understand how that's thought of and a lot of people who would want to and there's, you're starting to see some of these things happen in public like i think is that guy is it chris devos do you know him oh yeah I think he's like a little bit one of the earlier ones. Super, I'm not even sure. Super LP or something. What is he called? I think that's right. Do you know he has, he actually used to work at Brinko a oh, while did he? ago. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I, I wasn't even referencing it in such a direct uh I didn't realize it was so directly relevant. Like a long long time ago. Okay, yeah, superlp.com. Yeah. So you know, I'd say he's one of the first who's starting to talk about this. And I, you know, and, and I mean, he's been talking about it for, for a little bit publicly. He's maybe the longest running one uh, doing this publicly. And I think is Samir Kaji also beginning to speak about those kinds of things more publicly these days? Oh, I haven't heard of him. You know, Samir from, uh, from First Republic? Mm -mm. Let me see if I can find. I thought I want to say that he like recently left First Republic and now is doing some some sort of. Let me see if I can. Is this his Twitter on the side? Uh, yes. Oh, and he's founder and CEO of Allocate.co, host of the Venture Unlocked podcast. Yeah. So exactly. I mean, he he spent years in. At SVV, kind of being kind of the the banking client relationships with all the venture firms, and so he both like knows lots of venture firms and knows lots of LPs through that. I I don't know if he did a LP allocation work on behalf of maybe they had like a fund of funds. Actually, that that might be the case too. So I don't know. I don't know all the mechanics of where he touches, but I know he has recently, I think, departed First Republic, and now it looks like Allocate.co. Outlier investing, a new era of venture capital is upon us, and emerging managers are at the forefront. We are building a platform that allows limited partners to efficiently discover and access compelling institutional quality fund opportunities. So he's working on a new company that's, you know, very, you know, very aligned with like who he is and what his public brand has been for many years. But I'd say that's like, that's a whole category where, you know, everything's off the record, everything's done over private emails and in private rooms. And it's not, you know, in a sense, like venture capital used to look like that 20 years ago, and then YC kind of blew it open. And, you know, the LP and allocator world still is more like this than not. And so here's yeah, a couple of people who are starting to, starting to break it down. But I, I bet I bet there's stuff that, you know, that if you said you wanted to go be that person that you could you have enough relationships and knowledge and then that thing can expand to anything right that's like that's you know mm -hmm. infinite optionality um so i'm just saying like i guess the point is there's something in everybody's background or like how you got to where you are or what you're doing now that informs the types of things you might want to be spending your time on because it's yeah, like actually definitely. you just have more knowledge than the market has and that kind of stuff. And so you can be a unique voice. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, maybe a lot of it should just be, I wonder how much like, actually I'm kind of curious about how South Park Commons is operating their fellowship because how much of it, like what are the processes that they're trying to help uh, founders go through to figure out what they should be doing? It kind of should be like self-reflection like this in the beginning, right? Or maybe it starts with them, like even for the first six months, they just start blogging really right. 
intentionally and prolifically about a certain area and then see where it goes it's not I mean it's never just like boom here's my idea like this is gonna be my company right. so what are they doing at that like mystical like very right. mysterious pre-idea phase that we're kind of talking about All right and I think I mean you know I think you know probably stuff we learn through Nadia may help inform some of I mean I think everybody's learning this together right like I think South Park Cummins is running their first fellowship of this form. I think some people through the fellowship have some semblance of what they want to do. And then others like Nadia are much more kind of free form and open. And so I think there's probably a lot of, you know, both like the platform will learn from the cohorts and the cohorts are kind of designing the platform as they come together. Um, there's a, you know, interesting interplay between kind of, you know, creation and needs yeah. and discovery is this this is the first time this is happening i believe this is the first cohort yeah oh, I mean, that'll be it, super yeah, comments has been around for a while but they kind of i think i'd say they started as a little bit of like a curated co-working space and then after i think several years of that they you know in lots of programming and events and content and you know, people so it was like a really strong mm-hmm. network with a co-working space and i think they then like layered a fund in many years later and then the fund both can invest from the network, but also uses the network to expand footprint into other deal flow. And then um, this South Park Commons fellowship that Avicel announced, I think this is the very first kind of cohort of that thing. And so I think the rules for how that works and what are the services and where do people get value yeah. from are still being kind of discovered and defined as, as the program happens. Yeah. Wow, that'd be so interesting to look back like five cohorts from now and see what repeatable, if any, like frameworks or kind of process thinking have they put into place. Yeah, like does it, does it, I bet they'll discover that either like they want to find more people earlier and they have a better ability to attract that type of person because they have a message and process that really works for them, or they'll figure out that like, want to be slightly later than we thought initially and so we want to market and attract a different type and we have programming that serves a slightly different uh type of person like i think um the gentleman we met was it a week or two ago from sheet rocks i think is in the same program with mm-hmm. nadia yeah yeah, yeah. he has more like he wants to work on sheet rocks that's like his product so he's in a sense you know let's say more committed to that path and so the question is does the fellowship serve the nadis of the world better or the sheet rocks of the world better or is it some mix that kind of hybridizes and helps helps you know each of those in in similar related ways yeah but yeah I, so i think the the overall on the the building and public theme is you were pointing out that um, that the earlier people are, sometimes the less certain they are that building in public is a good idea. I think that's true. I think another thing is they often don't have necessarily like a big sub stack audience or a big Twitter audience, or they don't have like the basics established mm-hmm. to help kind of accelerate or bootstrap them into visibility. Um, yeah. And so one of the things I hope that we can do with the building in public show is in fact to, you know, create a little bit of that place where people can come right. and tell their stories and get more visibility. And so, you know, they can both think about new ideas, but also we can learn about them and their process and they can kind of get comfortable with the idea of building in public. Like ideally, like I think if, you know, if, if, if we can lower the barrier for what it takes somebody to talk about their stuff in public, I think that creates, you know, a big win for the world. I think that helps everybody build faster, find more connections faster. And so in a sense, we need to create a space that's safe and friendly to have those discussions while also having kind of enough, um, you know, enough kind of substance in what we help people reveal that they feel empowered and more comfortable and excited about that. And then their story gets out to more people and they, attract new partners, customers, you know, team members, investors, whatever it is that they might be be looking to solve for next. 
totally yeah kind of the success of each conversation it's probably and the magic will be like how many follow-up interactions does it directly or indirectly affect in the future right. with any any kind of person in the ecosystem yeah i think there's there's just so much you know like like we always talk about there's so much knowledge and thinking that's maybe stuck inside people's heads that they don't know the right do i blog this do i sub stack this do i tweet this they don't know the right yeah. forum i think it's sometimes also as a as a fresh creator in a type um it's hard to i mean it, i think it's easier to get people together we can like look at their website together if they have a deck or sketches on a napkin we can look at those together so it almost it's like a context for us to collaborate on making this video whereas you know if you if you imagine you're just like you're at day zero you know day negative 90 of you know a new startup idea and you're kind of like well do i just tweet this what if nobody cares and so in a sense you misty and i are here caring <laughs> we're like at least one face and name and and ear and person that yeah um that can listen and digest and care about what people are building which helps make it easier for them to tell their story because they can you know they have like a sounding board we're basically like a sounding board for you know everything going on in their mind whereas if you were to just you know broadcast it out on twitter maybe nobody cares or if you broadcast it out on youtube maybe nobody nobody's mm -hmm. like watching that new channel so so hopefully we can make make a place that uh that makes people kind of excited and comfortable about sharing mm -hmm. all of this you know all of these things going on in their head yeah yeah that's really exciting so so what what could possibly go wrong <laughs> i don't know it's kind of funny we're building building in public in public <laughs> right now right. <laughs> i put in chat but right, yeah, yeah like, what, should we about what could go wrong or what else we should be thinking about when we start this yeah i think I guess, it like like go on. Go oh i was gonna say like one uh, like less than ideal scenario for me would be having individual interesting conversations that then sort of like die after a day or two or like they're the highlights but then that's basically it so right. thinking more about do we maybe this takes care of itself like good stories are told the best highlights are extracted they're pushed into this ecosystem and like we have a little bit of a twitter following and we, we can do loop ins and stuff and just be like personally very proactive and making the the human interlinking happen which like usually yeah. only happens with a person's curation that knows a lot about what's going on but what if anything else should we thinking should we be thinking about in terms of like ripple effects of what happens live in these conversations right. yeah i guess you yeah, have the you know that's a good point what you know how, how do we how do we create the right highlights and get them to the right people on twitter i think the loop in the ability to sort of use these clips as memorialized moments that we can then loop people around that that seems to work really well already so i think that's pretty low risk like can we actually get the tooling that helps do that like i think it's not easy but i think we can get there um you know, we, we sort of like you mostly like fake it through a bunch of trickery and magic and like <laughs> stitching together. And I think the more that we can embody your process into software, I think the you know and if we can simplify that so that you know not only you can do it, but you know maybe I can do it and other people can do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that that's actually true. That I think that'll be big once the like, creation big. of highlights is more crowdsourced orient crowdsourcing oriented and people can also like tag each other in comments and reply and like more of that discussion can sort of jump off of things that are generated here mm -hmm. um but but i think like one of the let's say we were talking about sort of what could go wrong i think you know figuring out the right balance between the things that are you know quality and interesting to people who I think the magic is if we can help connect people to people they're not yet connected to and like ideas that they're not yet connected to. Um, and so 
how do we, when you want to think about what could go wrong, it's like, how do we make sure that we create the content, that the content is interesting. So when people are coming, that they're having a good time and, you know, interested in what's, what's kind of being discussed and what's being shown. And then, you know, is that going to be filtered and curated enough that, you know, tomorrow's session will also be interesting to many of the people who came to today's, Mm -hmm. but then also will the highlights travel far enough to expose new people and ideas? And I, I think we have signal that that kind of works, but I think, and then what's the balance of how much is happening, you know, while we're making the video together versus how much is happening kind of pre, you know, or sort of post video in the kind of asynchronous highlights. Um, my, my guess is like, you know, it's, it's not like a perfect formula, but there's some mix or balance there that we'll discover over time. Yeah. But it's hard to know a priori that we have it all right or that the tools are tuned to make the best experience here. Yeah, like live versus async, do you mean like does most of the interaction end up happening live? Like when does this feel the most participatory? Yeah, yeah, I think like, I think, you know, the live experience is certainly like you can participate. We've hosted sessions where we have like last participation in the live session. That's great. But then we also find that like we make highlights and we push them out and there's a lot of like opportunities to participate after the fact. And, you know, is it, you know, is the strong phenomenon and do we want to focus all of our energy and effort on helping make the live experience better or helping make the async experience better? Because I think there's already, you call it green shoots that each of them yeah. serve a purpose, but it's hard to do like everything all at once. Yeah. So I think we need to kind of build our own instincts around what, you know, even just that, that that's a fairly simple bifurcation of like live versus async. Mm-hmm. We have signal at each of them. We can't double down, triple down, 10x each of them. We have to kind of figure out where we're going to spend our time. We're going to spend our time focusing on making the live better or the mm-hmm. async better or, you know, a little bit of each. But um, I think those kinds of decisions, that prioritization is the kind of place like if we don't, if we're not very careful about prioritizing that right, I think mm-hmm. we can you know, we can end up, you know, focusing on something that, that isn't helping people as much as if we focused on the other. So, Yeah. Yeah, that probably translates to a bunch of different things, like behaviorally, how we think about, like, I don't know, maybe like stage and audience management to actual product features and stuff that we choose to build in and when. Mm-hmm. So... I think that's a good framework to have in mind. Yeah. Um, I, I almost feel like when, when I think about the ideal experience as a consumer, like, I mean, I, I love making these videos, but as a consumer, I feel like the ideal experience is like, I just, you know, I know about a highlighter, I'm registered, and I get an email once a day that I can just like, watch the five minutes of what was amazing yesterday. You know, almost, it's, it almost has like a dispo like quality to it. It's like, you know, 9 a.m. Yeah. Every I day in the morning, the moment. email, yeah. I do it and then that's it. I don't have to be on it all day. I don't have to like keep refreshing and engaging with feeds and stuff. I just like do my thing and it's good and I'm happy to come back and I can't wait. In fact, hopefully I can't wait to come back tomorrow because I expect you know, to get as good stuff if not better. And that kind of, you know, that kind of like dispo, like, you know, 9 a.m. schedule. I hope that, you know, I hope that we can do a good job with highlights where, you know, we can get great, you know, here's five minutes of great highlights to watch at 9 a.m. or whatever time we decide to send it. And that that kind of is like enough that people say like, that was great. I can't wait for tomorrow. Yeah. Like to make that really work, you know, it's a mix of like product features and content and curation and you know, probably at some point some amount of signal so yeah in a sense it sounds sounds easy but it's you know it's not that simple yeah man i can't wait to start running these yeah and so we we've got i know we didn't um we don't actually have a 
an actual guest on today, but the format of the show, Building in Public, is that we would be inviting guests on and we would do kind of, you know, a couple hours a day, maybe, you know, 15, 30, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, depending. Um, and we would host people and we would sort of just fill up our schedule. So we always have, you know, you know, a couple or, you know, at least a couple interesting kind of story sessions happening each day. So I think we've got a lot of yeah. healers out, but we have to actually get our get our schedule going because at the moment yeah. I think we have nobody actually scheduled. Well, actually, that's not true. We a have lot of people on the wings, though. Yeah, we and have we a lot of people like push a lot of messages out today. Yeah, and, and I think we have people who were scheduled for lunch break. We're going to show up and we'll be like, "Surprise! You're building in public." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's not actually that different, but I think we have. Uh, let's see. I think we have Roger coming on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And I see a hold on the calendar. I'm not sure if that hold on Thursday may be also another one, but each of those are sort of, you know, we framed it to the guest as lunch break, but we can tell them it's now called Building in Public, but they're the kinds of people that we would want to have yeah. on Building in Public anyway. But they're so. still allowed to eat if they want. They're allowed to eat, yeah. <laughs> That's the one drawback, yeah, if we didn't mention. The main drawback to Building in Public is that you don't have a good excuse to, to eat. <laughs> with building you. in public with your lunch <laughs> not a snappy <laughs> nomming in public <laughs> <laughs> nomming in public yeah um yeah so i think well we can model the behavior ourselves <laughs> yeah right <laughs> we'll, we'll show them it's okay as we stuff our faces full of dried mangoes <laughs> by we i mean i <laughs> 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 um wow it's you know it's it's funny because we're kind of it's kind of you know the same as it's been for months but it feels really fresh and new you know now yeah, with this, this new focus, focus and kind of story around it yeah so yeah. i feel like a kind of a a new excitement and energy around like what what will be this week what will be next week how will this thing progress yeah so I'm excited to uh, to find out. So I know yeah. we're going to maybe kind of keep keep this episode a little bit uh, on the more compact side as we're just sort of getting our getting our sea legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so was was there anything else that you wanted to address or talk about today? No. Let's get these emails and okay. messages out so we can fill the calendar up. As we yeah. said, we start. Yeah. Well, we've got a bunch of it teed up, so I think we'll we'll jam on this this afternoon and and, and get stuff going. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks, Misty. All right. See ya.